The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. We'll pick up in verse 18 of Romans 8, and we'll read down through uh, verse 30. Romans 8, 18 to 30. <clears throat> For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. For the anxious longing of the creation wait eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows that what the mind of the Spirit is, because he, the Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together, or better, that all things work. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Thus far, God's word. Be seated. <clears throat> we look around us at a world of trouble. The world is like a tumultuous sea with giant waves pounding uh, on the shore with no person able to channel them, or control them. We can look far afield around the world and we see uh, uh, the encroachment and progress of evil, don't we? We see the awful persecution of Christians and Muslim and, and communist countries. We see a church around the world that is under the deceit of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Uh, we know of our own reformed church plants and mission works that uh, are suffering even in Albania and in Italy. Then as we would come closer to home, yes, look at our own culture, the encroachment of evil that has um, risen exponentially in the last few years, uh, the weakness of the church, the struggles of reformed churches, uh, again, the progress of the um, mindless churches that worship a God of their own invention. Many of our churches have had tensions and uh, we know of splits that are taking place uh, in our reformed churches. And then we can come even closer into our own community and how fraught uh, we've been with trials and uh, uh, medical issues and financial issues. Of course, you're constantly facing um, things unknown to us, but in your own life, and of pressures of being a student, most of you married, most of you with children as well. It is a rough world in which we live. How do we respond? So often we mistakenly use the word, I can't take the stress. But you see, stress is something that we do. Stress is not what comes to us. Those are circumstances. Stress has to do with how do you and I respond to the circumstances. We are the ones that create stress. 
not the circumstances. And so as we continue to work our way through Paul's dealing with trials, this morning I want to comfort you with the reality, to encourage you, to exhort you, that all these things are planned by God for us and for our well-being. Now we can see what Paul's doing here um, as he introduces us to the work of the Spirit in adoption and our inheritance. He introduces as well then the problem of difficulties and trials, that it is appointed as part of our inheritance, as part of our preparation as heirs to serve God here and enjoy Him forever, that our inheritance is going to be mixed with uh, trials. So he begins to address this issue. Uh, he says the trials teach us to look beyond now. There's something uh, better that's coming. We can see it in the creation. We can see it in our own groaning. He talks about a hope, the sure and certain conviction we have that these momentary light afflictions are bound into an eternal weight of glory. He further comforts us in the midst of our trials and afflictions with this uh, beautiful insight into the work of the Holy Spirit, who is the overarching uh, subject of this eighth chapter. He indwells us, and he's indwelling us. He's actually involved in an intercessory role, uh, taking out of our perplexity and our frustrations and our despair uh, the requests that properly need to be made to God uh, in those situations, knowing that when he makes those requests, uh, that they're all going to be answered according to his holy will. And now he comes to look at our trials in terms of the eternal purposes of God. He introduces this theme in verse 28. He'll then reinforce it with the golden chain of salvation in 29 and 30. But this morning, I want you to look at verse 28, where God says that all Christians, all Christians may know that all their difficulties will work out for good according to an eternal master plan. There is an eternal master plan that includes all things, all people, all places. Yes, eternal master plan that includes you and every detail in your life. So we're going to look at two things from verse 28. The amazing promise and the absolute qualification. First, the amazing promise, and it is indeed an amazing promise. There's probably no more amazing promise in Scripture than when God uh, uh, tells us in verse 38 that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now notice where he begins. He begins experimentally. He begins with something that should be commonplace to every one of you as a Christian. So he included the Romans. But he's including all who ever read these words in Scripture that we should have a certain settled conviction. But are for we know. It is a commonplace, of, should be a commonplace of our very lives and existence. It would be similar to saying that um, a person who lives in a free country knows that he's free. Or a child knows in a Christian home, a child knows that his parents love him. It's that kind of basic internal confidence that Paul is expressing here. We know. So can you say this morning, I know. Can you say with Paul, I know. I've got this subtle conviction. It's bound in Scripture. We can think of a couple of examples. Of course, the classic Genesis 50 verse 20. When Joseph confesses that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Those 13, 14, 15 years of uh, slavery, of uh, imprisonment, of separation from his family, all of that part of the master plan for the good of Joseph, but also for the good of the church. And of course, we can go to the most horrendous event that ever occurred in human history, and that is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and just one example of how the master plan works in Acts 4 when the disciples return from being threatened uh, with respect to um, their preaching of the gospel. Uh, 
They confess in verse 27, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, we know that that was part of God's eternal plan. We know that all the evil that was done against our Savior was all part of a plan in order to accomplish our salvation. We know. We know from Scripture. We actually know from human experience. If you know Christian biography, you can trace it out time and again. We know, because we've seen it in our fathers, how all things work together for good. And you should be able to say it in your own experience. You should be able to look back in the details of your lives, the most difficult details of your lives, and be able to say, I know. So Paul begins here with this great confidence about this amazing promise. Now the promise is that all things are working together for good. Let us think about the promise under three headings. The extent of the promise, the operation of the promise, and the result of the promise. The extent of the promise is threefold. In the first place, it is to all the church. This is in the plural. Paul says, we know that all things are together to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So it's comprehensive uh, in the recipients of the promise through all ages, yes, in the time in which we live. It's comprehensive now for the church that we look at overseas, for every believer we know that is suffering, for all the persecution, for all the unbelief. All of these things are happening to the people of God of which you and I are a part, for good. It, its extent is comprehensive in terms of the things. Now, we can tend to s slip over because the context is dealing with difficult things, but let me just remind you today, this is also true of your blessings. Maybe you don't think about it that way. But you have a loving father that delights to give good things to his children. Now, sometimes we want those good things, and they're not for our good. And thus, he doesn't give them to us. Whatever good thing he gives to you, he's given it to you for your good. But, of course, in particular, he's addressing here, uh, the, addressing the trials, the persecutions, the difficulties through which we enter into our inheritance. We can think again of the broad scheme of what's happening to the church around the world and persecution. We can think of the spread of evil. We see all the difficulties in our own country and in the churches here in our country, in our own denominations, where error seems to be rising up in many different places, like a jack-in-the-box all at one time. Um, but of course, again, uh, in our community as a seminary, in your lives uh, recently, the past few years, I look around the room and I think of uh, one trial after another. Uh, we think of those that are close to us, uh, like uh, Dr. Scipione or Pastor Seeley and uh, their deaths. We think of uh, children with holes in their heart or that, that won't eat. Uh, many of you know about those financial difficulties. I've spoken with some of you about uh, those things. Uh, then you're going to, some of you are going to have problems in your family. Um, Maybe, as we've heard, of uh, a father that is um, a bit estranged now because of the son's faith. Other things that perhaps you're not even able to share, except with your most um, uh, intimate friends. Do you begin to understand the comprehensive nature of all things? Can anything slip out from under that inclusiveness. But let's take it one step further. Your sin. My sin. Those things we look back on now and would greatly grieve. The things that we know that we did damage to other people. And yet God is so wise and powerful in the master plan that every sin is turned to good in his plan. From 
where or from what does the great King Solomon come? From adulterous relationship that was based upon military murder. To God work all things for good for his church. David, though he suffered greatly, chastisement for his sin. But David, if you were here today, say to us, I know. All of this worked together for my good. This is the one that is most difficult, not just in our own sin, but we look just in you know, recent times. Uh, a reformed missionary becomes a polygamist. Uh, a renowned pastor kills himself because he's exposed with uh, multiple sexual relationships. Another reformed pastor who had once been in prison and been walking with the Lord and doing a church plant robs a bank because he's back on his drug habit and now is in prison. A family ruined. Does that work together for good? Well, Paul says it does. When I wrestle with these things, I think about the myth of the phoenix. The phoenix was this mythical bird that would live so many appointed hundreds of years and then would burn itself on a pyre, a funeral pyre, and then would rise up again. And I think about these sins, they're really the gross sins, and they're God's, they're God's phoenix. It's out of ashes that the great glorious God accomplishes good things about which we will not know many of them until we're in glory. So it's, it's comprehensive and to whom it's given. It's comprehensive in all that happens, but it's measured. And this is also a great comfort. For all things to work for good, that means all things must be measured according to your capacity. And that's why he's promised that nothing shall befall you such as common to man. And he'll bring with the temptation a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So the extent, the operation of the promise, and I don't know why the New American Standard uh, goes against the AV, the ESV, everything else. And it's, it's a very isolated text that says God works all things. It's, the best text is that all things are working together. Now, at the end of the day, it's not any different. But the emphasis here is on the interaction of these things according to this divine plan. There'd be some medicine that you take that if you took one part of it, it would kill you. But when it's mixed by the master pharmacist, it heals you. Well, God is the master pharmacist. And he has mixed together the details, events, affairs of our lives so that there is an inner working according to his sovereign purpose that makes it always good medicine. He's doing it by the Spirit. And then the result, obviously, is good, as the promise states it. And this is that which is morally good, but which is beautiful and lovely. Now look at the ashes. And can we sit here and say, well, maybe not right now in the ashes, but what God is saying is that even that that now is in the ashes is going to be made lovely, morally upright, and beautiful. It is an amazing promise, isn't it? And it's all for you. But let's look at that then. You know, this promise... It was not one of those letters you often get in the mail that's to the resident, or they might even know your name, and you have qualified for some particular prize. You get those letters? Uh, uh, this is not to the resident, this promise. This promise is very carefully addressed so that there is an absolute qualification. And that qualification is twofold. It is subjective and it is objective. Now, the subjective, and that, in fact, is where Paul begins with the text, because in the Greek, he actually begins with, to all those who love God, all things are working together for good, even to those who are called according to his purpose. So the two qualifications are the bookends of the promise. 
but immediately the Holy Spirit is drawing us to this subjective qualification. This is for all those who love God. Now to love God is to have a delight and a pleasure in Him that uh, motivates us to want to obey, to worship, to dwell with Him. It's the distinguishing characteristic of the child of God, to love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, what do you think Paul says to those that love God? Why not say to those who believe in God? Well, it's because many can say they believe in God from an unregenerate heart. They can say that. But the unregenerate cannot say, I love God, you see. Uh, the unregenerate hates God. He would choke on uh, um, thinking that he would have to love God. Paul puts love here to distinguish. He's talking about those who are genuinely converted. So as he wrote the Galatians in chapter 5, true faith works through what? Love. Love is the outward manifestation of our taking hold of Christ for our acceptance with God and for our adoption and sanctification and glorification. He first loved us, we love Him. And so he focuses this now on the heart. He distinguishes uh, the true from the false believer with this very careful address to all those who love God. And so as you sit here this morning, in your conscience, can you say, yes, I love God. I love His Word. I love His commandment. I love His worship. I love Him in the beauty of His being. Now, none of us can say that we love God as we want to love God. As soon as we say those words, we're well aware of our lack of love for God, our idolatry, our wrong priorities, and everything else. And, of course, the lack of love for God, which is to be the all embracing commandment of God to love him with heart, mind, soul, and strength drives us back to Christ, who alone in our nature loved God perfectly while in the state of humiliation. In him, our lack of love is pardoned, but as we suck out of him divine life and power, he then is going to increase our love for the Father. He, he's given you the sacraments particularly for this end. That as you reflect on your baptism, you are mindful of what God has done for you. And as you feed on Christ at the Lord's table, you come and say, Lord, I, well, you were, we're not like the, the father of the demoniac child who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Isn't your prayer, Lord, I love, help my lack of love? Come to the Lord's table. Lord, I love, but I don't love as I ought to love. Create in me a greater love. For you. Of course, love is also appropriate because he's writing to us in the context of our adoption. And as we consider who we are in Christ as the sons and daughters of God, then of course our hearts will rise up to him in love. That's the subjective part. The objective part then is where now Paul begins to pull in the eternal master plan of God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Of course, the called refers to the glorious truth of effectual calling. Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds and the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, He doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. There's a general call that goes out, uh, but it's the Spirit blessing that call uh, to God's elect that makes it effectual. And so the Savior says, No man can come unto me lest the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day, showing the effectiveness of the call. All who are drawn by the Father to the Son are going to be glorified. That's what Paul will uh, spell out as he unfolds more of this purpose of God. But here now he wants us to begin to put this together. Why do you love God? I love God because... In eternity, God purposed to have an elect people saved by His Son for His own glory. 
In time, He sent that Son to redeem those people. In your time, He sent His Spirit then to work in your heart to hear the voice of the Father, Come, come. We then respond to Him according to His eternal purpose. So when Paul's preaching to Pisidian Antioch and we talk about the Gentiles. The Gentiles believed all who were appointed to eternal life. So you've come to Christ today because of this great purpose of God uh, planned in eternity applied to you in time. But the purpose of God is not then an isolated purpose. It's for the entirety of your being. For everything in your life, as God is moving each of us forward to that final glorification. And so the two things are put together. The um, purposes of God with the subjective. Now, I skipped over the result, but we see it under the purposes of God. Okay, what's God's purpose then? His eternal purpose in my life and your life through these trials? Well, uh, to sanctify us to shape us for heaven. That's a theme that's run straight through uh, this section. For a witness to himself. Um, so many people have spoken of uh, the witness that Phil Seeley had and Dr. Scipione had as they died and how they kept pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for the progress of the church, um, our personal struggles, but the struggles of the church itself and in Exodus, we, we're told that the more the Egyptians tried to kill the, the Hebrew male babies, the greater Israel multiplied. <laughs> and there's the biblical principle that uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. God's doing these purposes in our lives and in his church at large. And so we've got this amazing promise that God working with and through all things as uh, the divine pharmacist is causing all things to work together. Intricate patterns, patterns in your life and your relationships, patterns that we'll only fully understand in heaven and we'll spend a lot of our time there investigating the patterns and praising God for all of them. But all those who are Christians should be confident that God is working all things for their good according to this eternal master plan. Now, do you believe that today for yourself? How are you then going to deal with trials? Are you going to be like Garfield's cat and your stripes fall off every time you get stressed? Are you going to seek to heed that an admonition uh, from James, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. In light of what we have here, how are you to look at your trials personally, at the, the trials of the church that are around the world? Well, we, we look at these things in the first place seeking to um, understand God's purposes. We can't understand all of providence, but Scripture gives us many ways to look at these things and begin to understand that, yes, uh, I see I see what God's doing here, and, and my faith is then greatly comforted by that. Uh, we look then at our difficulties and trials um, with eyes of faith. And so we learn to submit with a quiet, childlike resignation as a weaned child on its mother's breast. We examine ourselves in the midst of these things. A part of the master plan is there for our sanctification. And so uh, God would have us to, uh, all right, now, am I being chastened in particular uh, for something? Is the church being chastened in particular for something? If that's the case, it will be obvious. It won't take a rocket scientist to, to figure that out. But after a clear, honest self-examination, your answer is no, then you simply know that this is part of my discipline as a child of God, increasingly to conform me to the image of the Lord Jesus 
Christ. And then pray. Pray with that humble submission. But pray, as Paul says, um, be anxious for nothing, but with all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You make it all a matter of prayer, and not for release immediately, but for God to give you grace to endure the trial to his glory, for God to work in your life that which is designed in the trial, and of course, for release. It's not wrong for us to pray for release, but we must seek the fruit of these trials as well, because God's promised us that they are working together for our good. Now, as men, most of you are going to be pastors. It's very important that you experimentally understand this in your own life, because if you're not believing it and practicing it, then you're never going to be able to help others. But on the other hand, what a God and what a gospel that he has called you and me to preach. To go to a world that is broken in pitiful condition with a promise that if you're in Christ, all things will work together for your good. A sovereign gospel is according to an eternal master plan, knowing then that when we preach this gospel that all those whom God has appointed to eternal life, will believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing promise. We thank you that we can claim it today, knowing that we love you, knowing of your purpose, your eternal work in our lives. Give us great confidence, Lord, with regard to this. And may we experientially say, I know. And may we be able to tell others of that out of hearts that do know. And may we gladly proclaim this gospel for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.